hole in your vessel, you reduce both of those. You no longer have a pressure differential because of the blood pressure across that interface, and you no longer have an automatic differential if your if if your holes are not large enough. So what is the um, interstitial fluid pressure within a cancer? Breast cancer is 29 millimeters of mercury, give, give or take three, compared to um, a negative pressure usually in the normal breast. Okay. So again, I'm telling you that the pressure is not going to be in your favor to move something out of the capillary into the tumor. The mean capillary and pressure in normal volunteers uh, is 20.5, give or take 4 millimeters of, of mercury. At systole, it's 26, and diastole, it's 20, almost, almost 18. So the point here is your convective, convective diffusion is significantly diminished when you're sitting in a tumor. Vascular situation. You're not going to drive anything across the capillary. What are the other consequences of tumors? So tumors are proliferating. You heard about that earlier. They're making many, many, many copies of the cells. So as these cells enlarge, you're putting the center of the tumor farther and farther away from the nearest capillary. Okay? And you have compressive mechanical forces of all these cells making these cells which causes the lymphatic vessels to collapse because they're very, very thin wall. They don't stand up to pressure. So your caps, you're, you're collapsing your lymphatics. So you've got no, you've got essentially no blood flow moving out of the tumor. Or, or lymphatic flow in there. So here are the consequences. What happens is, is in the center of the tumor, you have an area that's hypoxic and hypoglycemic because you're not delivering enough oxygen or glucose to the center. Those cells die. And they can even they can look like this on the on the uh, when you take this is called a histology slide. This is what you do in the, when you take a tumor out and, and uh, stain it with, with the hematoxylin and niacin. These are dead cells in the center of these are tumor cells and these are dead. Alright now sometimes you don't see dead cells but you can do stains and you can actually see that all those these cells are not looking under the microscope like they're dead, they're more toxic nevertheless. What are the consequences for drug delivery? So if, I, if I've already convinced you I can't get oxygen and glucose into the center of the tumor, what about the things we're giving through, the, through an intravenous infusion of the chemotherapeutic? This is adriamycin, which is one of the standard chemotherapeutic agents for breast cancer. And you can see from a study done in, in clinical, oops, clinical cancer research um, that cells beyond 50 microns from the vascular system do not receive a significant dose to kill them. Just a good question. How is it that the cancer cells in the center are able to survive if there is not much nutrient? They're dead. Even the cancer cells? Yes. So, so what, you wanna, what would you want to send out? Okay. You don't want to send it to the, to the cells that are dead. You want to send it, there's a, there's a rim of hypoxic cells right around the dead center. And they're your bad actors because they are selected out for being able to survive under hypoxic conditions. And we think they're probably the cells that don't get therapy and they're probably the cells that are actually able, in a Darwinian sense, to survive and then come out and be the recurrence or the metastatic <coughs> cell later on. Um, you can see, I'll just give you an example from clinical medicine, you can see a patient who has a huge tumor in their liver from metastatic disease, and you can see on the CT scan that it's dead in the center. You can see that it's just all necrotic vapor. I mean, that, this happens frequently, not just in the patient's liver. Okay, so we knew about this. Um, and I was at a, um, I was at a DOD Department of Defense breast cancer research meeting, and I heard about nanoparticles. So I want to tell you how I got into this. I set you up with what I do clinically, and then I started hearing about nanoparticles. So this was a solution that I came up with to the problem that I told you about a minute ago. And the, the nanoparticles I started working with are gold silicon nanoshells. And it was because the lecture I heard was given by Professor Naomi Hallis, who's at Rice. So that's why I started using those particles. There was nothing particular about these particles. There could be other ones in there, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm agnostic on this for the most part. 
as long as they're not toxic. So I just want you to understand there's nothing particularly, I think these are terrific particles, by the way, but you could use other things as well. But here they are, you can get an idea of the size. Here's the tennis ball, and here's glucose. And as you know, um, they are silica on the inside and they are gold on the outside, and that's going to be important in a minute. And the reason that that's important is you can tune nanoshells to where they absorb light. And there's a, actually a special, special area of the spectrum where you want to be for treatment in the body. And this is just to give you an idea. By changing the aspect ratio of the, of the nanoparticle, oh, sorry. I will learn this by the end of the talk. Um, you can change where they absorb light. You can see here's just a, a solid gold sphere. And then by changing the size of the gold on the outside, you can change it. And here's the important thing. Is you want to get your absorption into the near IR. And the reason you want to do that is there's something called the tissue optical window, which you probably all know about. But we want to be in an area where there's not other things in the body absorbing light. And the two biggest absorbers in the body are water and hemoglobin. And hemoglobin absorbs into about 500 nanometer, and you can see where water uh, absorbs. And so this is where we want to have our nanoparticle absorbing light. And you can get absorption, you can get absorption in the body up to six centimeters. There are, there's a few things, obviously, that are more than six centimeters from any body surface, but not a lot. So a lot of the body is with, with, within that range, so you actually can use near IR light with your nanoparticle to do things. We'll talk about what those things are. Here. So here's some scanning on the my micrographs of the nanoshells we used. Um, we started out with nanoshells that were um, 60 nanometers for the silica, and then overall were 90, once you put the gold on the outside. Here's the absorption spectrum at 756. And there was one other problem. And I'm going to talk to you about this in a couple of slides. But I, I told you I was an agnostic about something before. I'm now going to tell you I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm a heretic about something else. I don't believe in the um, enhanced uh, retention and permeability um, idea. OK, so you can all lay boo with this and throw me out. Um, this is going to be important, though, because I'm going to argue to all of you that I think nanoparticles have to be deliver, delivered into the body actively. They can't be done passively. Okay. And here's the reason why. I told you all about the business before about leaky capillaries in a neovascular system. This is a theoretical slide showing you what happens when the permeability of a capillary increases. And the point here is that as you get more and more leaky, you get no flow. And so with a permeability factor of 10, this is a capillary here, there's absolutely no net diffusion. So you can, you can put those nanoparticles into the capillary and you can push them through and they're just going to sit there and do nothing. So here's my slide to make my argument. Um, the enhanced permeability and retention effect, the idea here is that the tumor, tumor neovasculature leakiness and lymphatic flow compromises is, is supposedly responsible for this effect. And it should theoretically result in the, in the specific delivery of nanoparticles to a tumor because the rest of your vascular system is normal, correct? And so if you have these leaky areas, your nanoparticles should automatically fall out of that area um, just because the, the fenestrations of the capillary and the neovascular system are much larger than your nanoparticles. They're a couple hundred nanometers wide. So you should be able to just drop a 60 or 90 nanometer nanoparticle through that hole and boom, you're at the tumor. Now, almost all in vivo models demonstrate EPR. The problem is, is that the, the, the tumor models that are being used are not physiologic. So there's two ways you can grow a tumor on a mouse, for example. OK, let me talk about breast cancer, because that's what I know. You can either grow it in the mammary fat pad, which is exactly like the breast would normally be, but that's not how most people do it. They put it on the flank of the mouse, all right, which is called the subcutaneous. So we have ectopic and subcutaneous. Okay, but most of the most of the EPR work is done on subcutaneous flanked uh, models. Okay, so the central fluid pressure. Um, let's take a look between um, these two possibilities. Subcutaneous is 17 uh, millimeters of mercury plus or minus 6. 
or the topping is 30, plus or minus 9. And I told you a moment ago, normal capillary pressure is 25. So you're going to drive your nanostuff, whatever it is, into a subcutaneous tissue model of the tumor every time. I don't argue that that happens. It will happen, okay? But if you use something that looks more physiologic, when you put an orthotopic model, your differential is the other direction. It's five millimeters of mercury different, meaning it's higher in the orthotopic model, not in the capillary, and it's not going to fall out. So let's keep going. I told you a minute ago about the center of the cancer that's hypoxic. What does the body do to that? I mean, the body's aware of it. It's not doesn't go under the radar screen. What happens is the body recruits macrophages that start life as monocytes in the bloodstream. And it does, it does so because it elicits cytokines. So essentially this cartoon is showing you a monocyte that's being recruited based on all of these cytokines. And it ends up right being in the center of your, of your necrotic um, tumor. It's there for a purpose. Its purpose is to phagocytize that debris that's in there. All that dead debris and protein, et cetera, is being phagocytized by the macrophage. But again, it's, it's not the debris that's the problem. Those cells are dead. Okay, it's these. This is the orange, it's these cells in the periphery right here. The interface between those cells are pretty well oxygenated and those cells that are not. These are the bad actors. So here's a tumor. This is an actual cancer, breast cancer. And what you're seeing with the black is macrophage infiltration into the tumor. Some breast cancers are 70% macrophage. Now that doesn't mean all of them are. Be as low as 4%. Between 4 and 70% of the volume of a tumor is made up of macrophages. And how much of this, I mean, how many of these are recruited? All of them. All of them. Yeah. There are, there are very few macrophages living in the normal parenchyma. Um, and this is true for ductal carcinoma in situ. Oh, just one second. This is true for ductal carcinoma in situ as well. So this is an invasive cancer, but it also happens in the earlier stages. Is there already particular uh, cytokines being found for this recruitment of the macrophage? Yes, the cancer is making them. And I'm going to show you later that the testis is probably them as well. Any place there's hypoxia in the body, this will happen. It's not particular to cancer. It's particular, it's particular to the hypoxia and probably the hypoglycemia. It's the cell death that's particular here. So if you had a benign tumor that was dying inside, you'd see the same. So here was our idea. So I've taken a lot of slides to get you to find the idea, which was to do the following. Take the nano shells that I thought to you a moment ago. Let the macrophages phagocytize them ex vivo. And then put them into the bloodstream and let, let them be drawn into the cancer. All right? And then let them discharge their cargo once they got to the cancer. It doesn't matter to me that they're in the center where it's dead because they're going to also be able to deliver their, their whatever they have inside them to that necrotic, this area right around the necrosis, this hypoxic rim that I'm trying to kill. Because again, the rim of the tumor is going to be killed by anything I give it through the bloodstream. Remember, the first 50 microns will be pretty well, you'll have pretty good delivery of your use of systemic therapy. It's this area that we need to work on. And then in the case of nanoshells, just to shine near, near uh, infrared light onto them, let them heat up, and then with photodermal ablation, kill those cells. We're going to talk a little bit about this because nanoshells do more than just heat up. But at least for the first go around, our idea was to use them to heat up the cancer, heat up the macrophage, which would kill it, and then kill the epithelial cell that's going to leave the next door to it. So um, we went to the Indiana Blood Center and asked them for some old, outdated blood, which we separate from which we separated out the macrophages, the monocytes at that point. Um, we differentiated the monocytes ex vivo using the cytokine and CSF, and then put the nanoparticles in a petri dish with the, with the monocytes for three days. We did nothing special beyond that, and then we asked. How well did we do? Um, we used fluorescent nanoparticles first because we didn't want to go to EM as our first test. We used, so we could use just fluorescent microscopy. So these are fluorescent micros. These were a little bit bigger than nano. They were micro-sized. Um, 
because um, we incubated with the macrophages um, for three days, and you see the lovely red um, fluorescence in the sun. I can tell you, we, we were using pump focal microscopy so we could actually do three-dimensional re reconstruction. And although these look nuclear, they're not. They sit right around the nucleus. So then we went on to do EM with the, with the nano, um, nano spheres themselves, nano shells. And here it is. This, this represents only one ten thousandth of one macrophage. You get an idea how much. Because I always get asked, how well do we load them? I haven't been able to quantitate it yet. I can just give you this visual idea of how well we load them. And then here's a blow up, and you can see, you can actually see the um, glass in the center and then the gold on the outside. And they're in some kind of a vesicle within the macrophage. Dr. Bashir was at Purdue at this time, so I came up there to do the next set of experiments. So we used this wonderful um, system where we could actually now put, put the loaded macrophages onto a microscope stage dial up the, the laser to the exact wavelength you needed for um, you know, the absorption maximum of the nanoshells, and then see if we could kill the macrophages. And we could. Um, this is a paper we published a number of years ago. As you can see, as we increase the um, power, what you're seeing here is that um, this dye will only go into the nucleus, into the cell if the membrane is disrupted. So all of these cells are essentially dead. Here you can see we did a cytotoxicity assay. So 50% power, we were about here, and then 75% and then 100% cytotoxicity. The second question we asked was, did time make a difference? So now we're, we're changing the power of the laser here. The second question is, does, does the length of the radiation matter? And the answer is really didn't. It, it looked like whatever we did was almost instantaneous. So here you'll see. One second, ten, uh, 10 seconds, and 30 seconds. And you can see on the cytotoxicity there was really no statistically significant difference. So it was almost immediate. We then did some in vitro work. So you can actually set up in a, in a soft auger system this idea I told you about before, where you have a sphere of cancer cells, and then you have a center that's necrotic. Okay? And we made these tumor spheroids. So what you can do is you take the you take your epithelial cells and you make sure macrophages with them. You grow them in agaros, and after a while, number of weeks, you'll get this necrotic center. And here are these stained macrophages on the outside. So we did the same thing, but then we irradiated them. So I'm trying to show you what you're seeing here. This is this this is like a, a half of this sphere. So if you were seeing this, the rest of it's here. The center that's black is the necrotic center. The green is the rim of epithelial cells. Okay. The red is the dead macrophages after we've irradiated it. Okay. And the color here, the yellow, is because we've had intercalated macrophages within the epithelial cells that got irradiated, and they're next to the green. So, your study used the process of where bring the nail particle to the tumor area and the release in that area? Yeah, so the idea is that the heat will disrupt the macrophage and there will be bulk heat transfer that will be high enough to kill the neighboring epithelial So how do we supposed to be like that? Is this through the drug vessels? Through the drug vessels? Deliver the macrophage? Yes. Yes, something like that. So if we can put it down to the tumor area, how is it? I'll show you some. I'll show you some um, evidence later that it doesn't go just to the tumor. It goes to the other places that you'd expect. you inject macrophages into the bloodstream. They're going to end up in, in, the, in what's called the reticular endothelial system. They'll end up in the liver, and they'll end up in the spleen, and they'll end up in the lung. Mm -hmm. They will. I'll show you. I'll tell you. I don't think that's a bad thing. So I, I, I think if, how is it that you're activating this? this uh, so not nanoparticles, are you activated by heat, I understand, but how is it that it's, it's able to kill the, the, the cancer cells? Just by, by the heat. heat transfer. Just by heat transfer. And so, and what happens to the, to the nanoparticles after they're done, you know, after they're killed? Yeah, I can only tell you what's in the literature, is that if you, according to the literature, you can get them up to 700 degrees Kelvin at the, at the nanoparticle, and they fracture. 
we don't we didn't do any EM or anything post any of this. I don't know. That's supposedly what they will do. Now I'll just show you one other thing. I mean, one of the questions is toxicity. Um, gold nanospheres, not shells, but spheres, have been used to treat myasthenia gravis for decades in the United States. They inject them into the eyelids. Um, and there's been no problem with this, there's no toxicity. The FDA has blessed them and they've been going on for ever and ever. So um, I don't know about the fracture nanoparticles, or these specific nanoparticles, but I would tell you that gold nanospheres are not a problem. There were two questions. Why uh, they are probably what's kosher with the uh, same kind of the one question. Another is uh, how do you deliver the, the light to the depths of the tissue? It's a great question. So um, the, the answer is again, you can get up to six centimeters of penetration. Um, some ladies have more than six centimeters between their tumor and their skin. So for those situations, why would this deliver it by taking my um, fiber optic cable through a, a percutaneous needle instead? I'm oh, sorry, your first question? Uh, why coding this as the same shell? Is it more stable? Or? With what? Because the nail particle is a gold nail particle, mm -hmm. coding this as the same shell. Is that the steady color? No, the silk is on the inside. Inside? Yes. Why? Because the you know, this is where I'm going to have to, I'll tell you what I know, and then if I can pass it off, I will. But again, it's this idea of the aspect ratio. So it's it's the refractive index between the, the gold and the, and the silica that, that allows you to have this difference in um, absorption and the tunability of the nail shell. We get it into the near IR. Because for instance, we're giving a gold, gold nanosphere is just all gold. Yes. They absorb it about 500 something. I don't remember exactly what the wavelength is, and that's no good because exact, that's exactly what hemoglobin does. So if I shine, if I, I do the same experiment without the glass, without the silica, yes. um, and I shine the, the light on, it will all be absorbed by my hemoglobin, and it won't get to the tumor. Is the nanoparticle degradable? If not, how to metabolize it? It will never metabolize it. It will just sit. But again, I pointed out a minute ago that we, we've been injecting gold nanospheres into the into the eyelids of myasthenic patients forever and ever, and they just sit there forever and ever and until these folks die of something else, and they have no untoward effects. Well, so benefit type of drug has been around for a pretty long time. So I was wondering if you, I mean, if that's a reason why you would think this technology would be better than that. Because I think benefit type of drug has a quite common, and it's not very effective. So yeah, I, I mean, on, on a theoretical basis, I think it would be better because then I'm not limited to the, the depth of penetration of the light. Um, and I'm going to show you in a minute some magnetic, well, some iron oxide nanoparticles we use. Um, it was a matter of who my collaborator was at the time. So again, I'm an agnostic on that. I would use whatever would work. I think it hasn't quite caught on. Uh, but it hasn't proven very effective so far. Then I would have to turn over to the, the nanoparticle. I think one of the issues with the magnetic nanoparticles is that you cannot get the same temperature. It's not as efficient. The conversion is not as efficient. So if you look at one-to-one -one comparison, these are much more efficient. And you need to apply a very high magnetic field to really get any reasonable temperatures. So then we went on to um, some experiments in some mice. And, and it's really not Terribly obvious. Whoops, I'm sorry. The, um, the mouse is in, is, is the head or the nose is up here in the anesthetic machine. Obviously, tail. And the tumor is right here. And we're looking at fluorescence again. We use a combination of fluorescent nanoparticles and um, the gold silicon nano shells to be able to follow the, the transit of these um, nanoparticles in the animal. And I showed you or told you a minute ago the problem with systemic uptake. This was predictable, okay? So this is 50 minutes after the tail main injection. They're in the lungs, a little bit in the liver. This is now 100 minutes. You can really see them in the liver and the lungs. And then over here, lung and, uh, sorry, liver and spleen. Now, if you're not a physician, you might 
say, well, that's a death knell for this idea because, you know, it's going to sit in other parts of the body and not get to the breast. But I'll tell you, that's exactly where the metastatic disease is. Not in the spleen, but certainly in the lungs and the liver. So if you can have either a heat or some kind of a um, nanotherapeutic that you're delivering, getting it to the, specifically to the liver and the lungs will be to your advantage. So I see this as a pan-metastatic and primary tumor opportunity. So do you have another issue with inflammation? Are they going to go there? Um, I don't know that. Um, I doubt it. it. It really needs to be not toxic. Oh. Um, and then these were ones who took the animal's um, individual organs out. So here's the tumor. Here's the liver. And here's the lung. Here are the EMs of those actual, um, this is the actual tumor. So this is an electron micrograph, because I wanted to actually prove that we'd actually gotten delivery specifically of the macrophage with the nanoparticle and it to the tumor. So this is essentially the necrotic center of the tumor. All this schmutz here is really schmutz. <laughs> and then here's your uh, macrophage, and here's the nanoparticle sitting in it. So uh, when the nanoparticle Nanoparticle fusion into the macrophage, does it leak out? It, does it gradually leak out to the environment, like a uh, vein or something like that? Um, you know, we haven't done that specific experiment, but you'll see later on in the brain studies that we actually have naked nanoparticles. But what I don't know is if they leaked or if they were injected. You know, because we, we centrifuge them, we centrifuge the macrophages to get rid of any unphagocytized particles. But that doesn't mean we don't take some up with us. So I don't know. <coughs> These are just some um, close ups of what I just showed you. So we can hear that. Um, now, the problem I showed, uh, it probably isn't obvious, but one of the problems we were having is that, you know, the, the uh, oh, sorry, please. I was just wondering so, um, so does that mean that you were able to cross the blood brain barrier? Giving away my punch. <laughs> <laughs> Just okay. We're still we're still doing primary therapy here for the um, The fluorescent studies weren't very helpful. It was very hard to follow how quickly that we, we delivered the nanoparticles just because of the problems with fluorescence. So I actually asked Professor Hallis to please make um, something I could see with MRI. So she um, very nicely made these same nanoparticles, except you put iron oxide on the outside so that we could use them to, to do essentially studies on how quickly we got delivery of the nanoparticles to the tumors. Um, we did some studies with phantoms first. So you just take an, an, an NMR tube like you use in the chemistry lab, fill it with agarose, fill it with your nanoparticles, and then put it in the NMR machine and see if it works, uh, which it did. And we did different. Um, concentrations of nanoparticles. I just want you to notice that it gets darker rather than lighter with the more nanoparticles that you have. So here's this concentration, 1.5 times 10 to 9, 3 times 10 to 9, and 6 times 10 Then we did the same experiment where I just showed you. We injected these nanoparticles that are already pegasitized in the macrophage through the tail vein, and then watched them by MRI. We watched the tumor by MRI to see when we got the delivery. So was it taking place within 10 seconds, 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days? What? And so these are just sections from the tumor. And you can see the outline here. These are different slices from the MRI. Okay. And here's the, here's the idea. Again, I'm showing you it goes from light to dark. So this is essentially delivery. So here's baseline in 4 hours and 24 hours. So I don't know exactly when between baseline and four hours we got delivery, but we had no delivery beyond that because it was exactly the same 24 hours as it was before. And we're probably not going to do much better than that because if you ever try to do small animal MRI, it's quite difficult to get them anesthetized and get them in and all of that. I mean, we might be able to do a two-hour time point, but I don't think we'll do that better than that. And then the final thing we did on this part of the study was to ask okay, you've delivered them there. Can you actually show that you can do this photothermal business? And so what we did was to take a temperature probe and put it onto the skin of the tumor and then irradiate the tumor that had the delivered macrophages. 
And so you'll see um, um, control is in black. And then we have two different um, wattages, one watt and half a watt. And you can see that our temperature went up by 20 degrees centigrade at the skin with the radiation of the natural. Now, the problem I have, the reason I can't take you any further than that is because we were unable to um, find out where specifically we were killing anything. So we took the tumors out of the histology section and looked at the cancer. And I can't tell you that we saw a bunch of necrosis. But it may have been that we did it too quickly. Because we essentially irradiated and, and, and did our euthanasia immediately. So we might have just been smarter to have irradiated and let them live a little while, and then euthanasia, and then look at the cancers, and let life take its progress. Because so, we may have stunned them and killed them, and then we would see them, the cell death at a later point. Now I'm going to go on and talk to you about um, the brain business. Um, so I'm a clinical physician as well as a scientist. And um, breast cancer systemic therapies have gotten amazingly better in the last 15 years since I started practice. Um, and that's a great, great blessing for patients. The problem is, though, is that while we're doing a really wonderful job controlling the metastatic disease in the lung and the liver, we're now allowing these ladies to live long enough to have brain mass. So in the past, what would happen is that you might have brain mass, but you'd never become symptomatic because you die of your lung and liver disease before you'd ever see the brain mass. And it's not just breast cancer that's a problem. So um, brain metastasis outnumber primary breast brain disease by 10 to 1. Um, the most common primary tumor sites are not breast, but actually lung is harder, and then breast, melanoma, and then GI tract cancer. You can see the numbers. The incident rates is, is thought to be 170,000 per year in the United States. And, I, and I've been doing some work looking at breast cancer. You, know, you might think that, that, that it's not a problem for women with localized disease, but it's not. 2.4% of women with localized breast cancer, meaning it's not even in the lymph nodes, will eventually have brain lymph. 2.4% of 200,000, well, there's 200,000 women in the United States who develop breast cancer, and up to 15% of them, depending on their state, will have metastatic disease. It's a huge problem. Um, how, when you say eventually, how eventually, like, is it difficult to predict, or is it typically like? Years, years. You know, it's a great question. It will depend on what their um, tumor is. Um, so, um, like a, what, what would it be, stage two? No, it's actually interesting. Um, recurrences are different by whether or not you have the estrogen receptor or not on your cancer. Estrogen, um, estrogen responsive. Right. And they're taking the estrogen response. Yeah, but in the, it's, it, it's a biological problem, though. Um, because in the days before we had great therapies, you know, you can actually look at natural history. And women who have ER positive disease, okay, have a, have a lower chance of recurring. Okay, but the recurrence rate never goes away. Okay, so the, the height of we're talking all recurrences, not just effects in the brain. Okay, the recurrences usually come the highest time is about 18 months to two years post original therapy. All right, so their their peak is a lot smaller, but it goes like this, and then it just does a tail. ER negatives are much higher, but they go and they cross at about three years, and once they get down there, they go almost to zero. So the point is, it's not a good thing to have an ER negative cancer, but if you get out to four or five years out, you're much less likely to have a recurrence than an ER positive patient. That's that recurrence is your brain. It could be all causes. Um, so small cell lung cancer, 10% of patients have brain mental diagnosis. And non-small cell lung cancer, um, people who have locally advanced are at highest risk of Half of them have a brain mass. Now, breast cancer, the, there are two types of breast cancer that are most likely to metastasize. The HER2 positive, which you've heard, heard about before today. Okay? And then there's something called triple negative, which means these cells do not, do not express estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, or HER2 over express HER2. And those are the two types of breast cancer that are most likely to end up metastasizing to the brain. If they do, the median survival is dismal. Between two to 16 months. The mean one year survival is about one out of every five patients. And as I said earlier, it's now becoming the first site of relapse for many women 
been able to do such a great job with their other disease. Do we know why? I have a feeling it's biologic. I think there's something about these two subtypes that make them particularly, I don't know if, you know, if, I haven't thought about it in this way. I don't know that there's a, they're more likely to metastasize. Certainly, HER2 in the days before Herceptin was a very bad prognosis to happen. So it was likely to, to, uh, to spread. But I think there's something particular to these cells and why they're able to colonize the brain so well. You have to think about it this way, too, and I know you, one thing of you are engineers. Um, these cells are essentially setting up territory. They're in a territory that's foreign to them. It doesn't have the right growth, growth factors and cytokines that they would usually have in the, in the breast. When they end up making their way to the brain or to the lung, they're in a milieu that they're not used to, but they're able to respond to those growth factors just like, like they would to the normal growth factors they would see in the breast. They're very versatile. And so there's something about HER2 positive and triple negative that allows them to set up shop in the brain. Now, here's the blood-brain barrier. I just thought this was a great picture. So essentially, what they did is they injected a radiolabeled histamine into this mouse, I assume, like that. And, and what you can see is that you see the darkness everywhere. It's lining the GI tract. And there's absolutely nothing in the brain to respond to. I mean, this is like, this is like the great poster child to show you what the blood brain barrier is. And this is a nice cartoon in a different way. Um, the problem with the blood brain barrier is this. Most drugs and small molecules in most capillaries will get between the cells. They'll be able to make their way between two cells that are next to one another. With these, in the brain, that's impossible. The junctions are so tight. And so if you're going to make your way through the um, the capillary of endothelium, you're going to do it by going through the cell. And if you're going to go through the cell, you have to be awfully small and you have to be hydrophobic. You have to be nonpolar to get through those membranes. Okay? Or you have to be a substrate for a transport system. And you have to be smart enough to avoid being kicked out by the efflux systems. So you have not only do you have to find a way in, you have to avoid being having the bouncer bounce you right back out. So I just I'm repeating what I just said. So brain entry under physiological conditions, drugs and other substances get through by passive transcellular diffusion, and they have to be small and polar. Receptor mediate, mediated transcytosis or specific carrier system. And then you have to avoid getting booted out by efflux transporters. How small? How small? About 400 Daltons is about the limit. Really small. And here's the answer to your question. Um, somewhere, um, just about 98% of small molecules do not cross the blood brain barrier. 100% of large molecules do not. And why is that important? Because when I say large molecule, I'm talking to you about monoclonal antibodies. So we have this great drug, Receptin, which is an anti-HER2 drug, which is probably the, one of the best drugs we've ever had, and it does not cross the blood-brain barrier. And it's HER2-positive disease that goes to the brain. So it's exactly what you need. You need to get therapy out there, but you can. All right? How do cancer cells overcome that barrier? They're actually able to sneak through. You know, they make, make, make themselves small. It, they probably are able to make the teleproteinases and other things to degrade protein. Um, beyond the physiologic problems, this is kind of a, a nihilistic approach of, of everybody else, which is that less than 1% of drug companies actually have a blood brain barrier targeting program in their company. This is as of 2005, so it's a little bit old the data, but I doubt it's much different. And less than 1% of epidemic neuroscience programs have special specialty in transport across the blood-brain barrier. How do um, how do things like drugs that affect the brain, including you know, including things like antidepressants, but also like dangerous drugs, how do they get into the brain? Okay, most of them diffuse, and this article was quite interesting because it pointed out that there aren't very many that do. So you can't get Parkinson's disease drugs across. You can get alcohol across. You can get anti-migraine. 
you get some seizures, drums of frost. But they're essentially, and I don't remember what they were, there are only four types, four categories of drums that you can actually get across the brain. <coughs> Well, I'm going to show you, you can use the monocyte. Um, I don't know that I would want, want to use the cancer cell itself, um, but it's not a bad idea. Um, the traditional ways of getting things across the blood-brain barrier were to make small molecules, like I said, 400 Daltons and smaller. Eject them when you're actually doing some kind of um, neurosurgical procedure, actually put them in. But that's actually a problem, too, because um, there's a great paper I was reading over the last couple of days showing that if you put a depot into the brain during a neurosurgical procedure, 90% of the drug will not get beyond two millimeters. So it's, it's a very, very, very bad problem for getting any kind of blood drug delivery or physiologically disrupting the blood-brain barrier. The problem with that is, is that that lets everything else in, too. The blood-brain barrier has a purpose, which is to keep, keep out bacteria and other infectious agents. And if you use DMSO or something of to, to disrupt the blood brain barrier, you can also allow what you don't want to get through. So I was talking to you about this a minute ago. We have two HER2 drugs that are FDA approved. One of them is the monoclonal antibody, which is called Mestuzumab or Hercetumab. It has very poor um, penetration across the blood brain barrier. The, the CSF or cerebral spinal fluid concentrations are 300 times lower than they are in the serum. Lepatinib is a small molecule of tyrosine kinase inhibitor that works intracellularly. So it's small, it's polar. You might think, well, gee, it has a better chance of working. Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't. Uh, in a paper that was just published in earlier this year, uh, it was the, the concentration of, in the brain mass was 10 to 20 percent vaccine in the visceral lung mass. And they then took the cells out of the brain and asked the question, well, is, did, they not, did this not work because the cells were, were resistant to lepatinib, or was it a delivery problem? The cells that they took out in the culture were still, were still sensitive to lepatinib, so these were, these, this is a delivery problem. The reason why these, these cells did not respond to lepatinib is lepatinib never got to them. So, um, we decided to do the same thing we had just done with the, with the primary cancer and ask the question whether we could deliver um, nanoparticles to the brain using the monocytes. And we actually had some, some ideas that this might work. Um, there, were, there were two papers that I read when I started this. Um, one showing that you could deliver nanoliposomes containing serotonin to the brain using macrophages. And serotonin doesn't cross normally. And the second was using uh, macrophages to carry depots of, and, and and set up depots of antiretroviral drugs for people that have neurocognitive problems, secondary HIV infection. And those work as well, at least in the animal models. And then there was some old data from um, Josh Fitler's lab at MD Anderson showing that macrophages, at least in an experimental model, would cross the blood-brain barrier. And finally, there was some clinical data showing that somewhere in the order of about 15% 25% um, of a metastasis was made up of macrophages. Here's the range, 4 to 70%. Now, the specific means by which macrophages are recruited are not known, but at least for primary cancers like gliomas and glioblastomas, uh, it looks like um, these two are the um, cytokines that recruit macrophages to primary cancer. So the point here is that if this worked, it doesn't need to work just for men, so it actually could also work for primary breast cancers because macrophages are also recruited to those two things. So the first thing we had to do is set up an animal model of brain mass. And for that, um, we were very fortunate to be um, presented with some cells that have been um, developed at the NIH. This is MDA-231 cells. This is a breast cancer cell line that everybody uses if they do breast cancer research. But what they had done was to take these cells and inject them into the mouse and see which cells went to the brain, take those out, re-inject them, go to the brain, do it again over and over again until they selected out the cells that were specifically metastatic to the brain. Okay, and these are injected into the heart, not into the tail vein. So you actually take the mouse, take your syringe, 
and inject them into the into the heart, and then let them send them straight up into the brain where they set up their um, metastasis. And these are these have the fluorescent GFP construct in them. Transfected, so we can see them. And then we did the same experiment, just one second, that I showed you a moment ago. Load the macrophages, inject them into the tail vein, and see if we can get them into the brain. So how the cell You know, there's, there's some really interesting um, studies, and I don't know if it's exactly this way, but they're actually able to deform themselves to such an extent that they can squeeze through this type junction. So, Here's the, here's the end of the story. Um, here's a photo of the brain we've removed from a, one of our mice. Okay. The green is, again, the metastatic has a GFP in them, so we can see them. And we use red fluorescent proteins, uh, sorry, red fluorescent particles as our nanoparticle in the macrophages. So you can see that most of the um, events are here, and essentially is over, overlaid by the, the um, macrophages that have delivered the yeah, now part of it. Here's sections, and I don't know how well this shows, but anyway, I'm really sorry this doesn't show very well, but brain, brain the brain parenchyma is in the black back here. Each one of these is a met. Okay. Here's the nanoparticle. We then took an anti-macrophage antibody that was labeled with a blue, specific blue, and that's this. And then you can see the merge of all three colors. So here's the macrophage, here's the metastasis with the macrophage in blue carrying the red nanoparticles inside of it. And you can see that it's actually interpolating and almost kissing the, the metastatic cell. Now, uh, why, why did you choose the macrophage? Because in the brain, they use microglia as the yeah, but the microglia live there, right? Uh, yeah. They're, so they're, they're parenchymal, they, they're, they're there. I can't deliver anything to them, because they're already there. But you can use ICD injection for the, those, those cells, a, a microglia who carry your, for instance. Yeah, but I don't, want, I don't necessarily want to do an injection oh, yeah. until they see it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so I know what I'm thinking. I, I don't want to heat these though. Because truly, if we get bulk heat transfer with photothermal ablation, like we did in the brain, let me back up. If I heat the breast, it doesn't matter. If I have a couple centimeters of damage of normal breast beyond the cancer, no one's going to care. Because when I operate, I already take a centimeter of extra tissue out anyway for my margin my margin. So I'm cutting out an extra centimeter. So if I have bulky transfer past a tumor, I don't care. I have the brain though I care. Because I could be knocking out the panel lessons or the ability to speak or something very, very important. So our idea now is not to do photothermoblation, but actually take a cargo with us in the macrophage. And that's going to be my last slide, my cartoon slide. So, um, this is a grant we've just put in. Uh, I take no credit for this. This is all Naomi Hallis' idea. But what she's done, and she's published this recently, is to take um, the nano shell and coat it with double stranded DNA. And then put something, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Anything that's polar will sit between the two strands of the DNA. That's the little blue. And then you can actually shine your um, resonant light with the plasma resonance frequency. Um, and you will release the double stranded DNA and you'll release the carbon at the same time. Now what's cool about this, it doesn't do it by heat. I know you all know about DNA, you heat up DNA and, and, and the hybridization is broken and the strands separate. But this is done with no temperature increase. It's likely what happens is that the electrons from the plasmon are released and they get between the two strands of the DNA and since it's a negatively charged phosphate, phosphodiester backbone, it pushes them so there's no heating to get the un unannealing of the DNA. And so our idea, again, is to hurt them into the macrophage, heat it up, and then let them deliver their therapy. And I can tell you one last thing, and I'm going to take the question. Is we've already started some skull experiments, and I can tell you we can get the light through, believe it or not. Just um, curious, what type of DNA It's a great question. I don't know. So, man, if this works, we're going to have to get the blessing of the FDA, and I don't know how they're going to be too happy about just 
Because the, the cancer itself has a lot of oxidative stress. That means that energy source is there. Why don't you use chemical driven source to heat up the nanoparticle? No, I, I think it's a great idea. I, I think you know you can deliver just let's say our delivery method works. You could deliver anything. You could do a nano liposome that had a therapeutic in it. You could deliver um, a nano rod. I mean there's you know the your toolbox is expanded you know, exponentially, once you can get to it there. Um, and then you can release it. I mean, you have to do two things. You have to deliver it. If it's in the back of the you have to release it. Uh, yeah, uh, I, have, I have to adjust my question. Is, that, is there a difference? Because you choose the photo uh, thermal reaction first, in the first time. So what what's the benefit of it? Is that easy to operate, or is that uh, hard to deliver? the oxidative stress to the heat up, heat up uh, energy. I, I'm wondering about the... the, the uh, I don't think, I, again, I, I don't know specifically what you want to deliver, but I think it's a great idea. I think it's doable. We did it this way simply because this is the particle we had on hand. And it was it was non-toxic to my, I mean, I, I can tell you that now because the cross college has been done. But I already knew a priori that the gold nanospheres have been used in the body for years. 
So I figured I was that much closer to getting approval if I could get this down the road because, because there's a history of using nanoparticles already, gold, I mean. Um, so that was my thinking. And also the activation is easy. Right? Activation optical by shining a light like the nanoparticle is much easier. Yeah, but it's got a penetrate problem, actually. I was just wondering if you passed out the slides in the lecture. Yes, I mean, they're downloaded, I know. So I assume that they're out. Have any, have any nanoparticle incorporated with thermal, ther with ther thermal therapy in clinical trials so far? Yes, yeah, so these are these gold nanospheres are already in three, two and a half. I'll tell you what they have. Um, they're already in head and neck cancer because that's really easy to do. You can just open them out and inject. There's no delivery issue. So they're just like, okay. Um, <laughs> they're in, um, they're in pro they're advanced prostate right now. And they're going to be, the half is on August 8th, they will open a clinical trial for lung. And that'll be done with a bronchoscope. So again, these are not being delivered yet. Um, they're just being, well, they're being delivered, but physically they're being delivered because you take, you can look at the tumor and inject with the syringe. Let me go here. Uh, I just wondered how long to the focus the lives through the brain and focus the area of the brain. It's a great question. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to digress for a second. Um, I went to my local butcher and got this call. And I've done that so far, and I know what the scatter is like on that. Um, the brain is going to be a bigger problem because the brain is a terrible scatter. Um, especially a myelinated, myelinated brain. So children, are, their brains aren't myelinated yet. Um, you can actually deliver a fair amount of near IR light to them. You can actually see it. I mean, they do they do oxygen um, monitoring on children by shining light through. You can see it doesn't work on adults. And so I don't know that um, what we're going to do yet. We're doing random studies now to figure out how much scatter there is. Um, if, and Dr. Hells simultaneously is seeing how low she can go on the power. One watt is the lowest they went, but my guess is they might could release the lower. You know, and we might be able to still deliver enough fluid. But I don't know. It's a huge problem. I don't really want to be doing craniotomies to make this work. I mean, that's the way you can do it too. But uh, what percentage of these nanoparticles uh, do you get from other parts of the body? Like, like yeah, I don't know. I think we, we're, we're working on that. Um, I think just looking at the fluorescence, the majority go elsewhere. So uh, I know you mentioned that you guys have done cytotoxicity studies, but I'm just wondering about the chemical. Have, have you guys done studies on the impact of the chemicals themselves on neural function? And I know that some of the drugs have been tested for toxicity and you know, other therapeutics. But I mean, in normal circumstances, they are protected from the brain by the blood being buried. So in this case, they're trying to succumb and then put it into the brain. So that might have you know, other side effects that, I mean, that you, you wouldn't necessarily know about. And if they don't cross the blood brain barrier, would that subsequently cause a huge buildup of these chemicals? I mean, with unknown effects in the brain itself that, that will not get broken down or cut off. Right. I don't know. Um, they passed the FDA. I mean, they passed the tests for so far to be taken in a clinical trial. They're about to publish the dog study, um, but of course these are just you know randomly. I don't know, but they've been injected into the bloodstream, and, and everything has been based on that. So the toxicity is based on on those studies, and they showed no toxicity. None of that was delivered to the brain. So, uh, what is the concentration of uh, nanoparticles per microfiche uh, that you use? And does that affect uh, you know, the signal uh, that goes through uh, you know, the radiation that is here, that is transformed into heat? It will. It's one of our goals coming up. We don't have the ability to do this. Rice has the ability to measure. There's a, there's a chemical reaction you can do to measure it, gold, you know, anything. They have the ability to do that. We don't. So we haven't been able to quantitate the amount of you know, particle uptake per macrophage. But that's one of the things on our list to do. Uh, just a, a follow-up question. So 
do you think that if you if you add too many nanoparticles, would that affect the, the how well the, the macrophage uh, makes it through the, the vessels and, and gets the I don't know about that. I worry more about um, aggregation of the nanoshells because it changes where their absorption action is, and there's a redshift with that. Um, and I'd probably worry about getting out of the, the particular um, water window I wanted to be if I had too many um, particles being taken off. And I don't know the answer to that. You know, quite frankly, I didn't show you the picture, but macrophages, you know, this is like a smorgasbord for them. Um, you, they start out, you can't see, you can't see these sh nano shells, but they're small. They eat them or phagotize them to such an extent they turn macrophages black. You can optically <coughs> see them after you let them sit for three days. I mean, they just look like they're beckoning them. I mean, so our problem is not their uptake. I mean, maybe limiting their uptake rather than worrying about not enough. I was wondering, uh, uh, the, uh, the nanoparticle you're covering, <coughs> so it both uh, immune response to the uh, We haven't seen it in the mice, but we've not, not let many of them go very long, so we haven't let them go for a long, long period. They haven't so far. Is there any proof that nanoparticle can escape on the organ? Uh, from the macrophage, if not release from the macrophage, you would it, then the macrophage instead of the tumor. I, I would say that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, let's, let's say that it's a couple possibilities. I think they're probably inert if we don't do anything. Um, they're going to go there anyway. I mean, the macrophages will go to the, to the breast metastasis or to the primary cancer on, on the basis of their being recruited here. I guess without any light, they'll just sit tight. Um, but I don't know that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's the source of your microphone? Um, right now, we are using um, macrophages we get from the blood bank. But ideally, we would use Mrs. Smith's own macrophages. I mean, though you know the cytokine will produce by the cancer, why don't you treat this, those uh, macrophages and let them become uh, some antigen around around these macrophages and you can get better affinity with the cancer cell. Why? That's, that's a possibility. Um, I, don't want to, I don't know if you're thinking about using the uh, antibodies <coughs> to deliver, are you? Antibodies won't cross. Where does any cancer cell come from? Well, it comes from something that started out normal. 
And although it's gone bad, it's not completely out of the family tree. And so a lot of things that it makes are made by the normal cells. So then you have all these problems with toxicity, right? When you target something that's not specific. So when we give a general chemotherapeutic, we hurt the cancer, but we hurt the hair and the GI tract, etc. But then when you go to targeted therapies, we have very little limited targets. I mean, the targets really are right now in breast cancer, and we can talk about other cancers, but you know, ER and HER2. That kind is maybe it's coming down the line, um, maybe some other you know, pathways, but there's a lot of cancer that is untargetable. Um, and so when I was thinking about this, I was trying to think about something that was targetable, that was unique to cancer, and that was non-discriminatory about the subtype of breast cancer. If you have, if you have a cancer that's growing, growing proliferating enough, it will be dead in the center, and it will cause the macrophages to come in, and that was my targeting idea. Um, so I'm not sure how to you know, use the electric chemo chemotherapy yet, because it has to be somehow get it to the target. Um, and a lot of times, you know, we're limited about, we're limited also by the um, imaging we have, right? So there's a lot of cancers we don't pick up that may be hypoxic. I mean, in other words, you could actually, let's say we had a, a mammogram. There might be cancer that we don't pick up, but, but it might be hypoxic. So if I delivered the therapy, it wouldn't matter that I didn't know it was there. It would still be treated. Then they get to the cancer site from the metastasis and revert back to the epithelial 